So without further ado, then let's uh, call the meeting to order since we have a quorum and, um, and see if there are any additions or deletions. I have one addition to the agenda, but uh, ask the committee first if there are any other additions or deletions. Yeah, Nels, you and I talked about um, additional funding. Is that under other business and strategic planning? Strategic planning, yes. Thank you. Great. No additions. Um, I was just going to add a um, update on the ribs issue and south side because there could be a potential governance issue, you know, that um, related governance issue at some point. Um, and that can be other business and maybe part of staff report. Nels, would that be okay? Let's just let's just do it at the, the first item under other business and just have it as a standing item. Fantastic, great. Okay, we'll do that. Super. So then uh, we'll see if there are any, have there been any uh, public comments um, sent in, Nels? Charles, did you receive anything? No. Nope. No, we have no no written comments and nobody waiting to uh, provide public comment. All right, great. Oh, you're, yes. We are so. set up so that someone could comment live. I mean, we talked yes. about that at the prior meeting. Yeah. Yes, we are, yeah. And so how do they know how to do that? Where is that? Post they, act, they actually have access to the same Zoom credentials as you have. We would just put them in the waiting room uh, until we had public comment and then send them back to the waiting room afterwards. A virtual waiting room. Yeah, yeah. very civilized, yeah. Great. Um, so no one in the waiting room, then we will move then to uh, the approval of the minutes, review and approval. Uh, has everyone had a chance to review those? Yeah. Right. Yes, I'll move the minutes. Thank you, Sue. Um, Can't second. I'll second them. Thanks, Kathy, and welcome. Um, great, all those in favor of the minutes? Aye. 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 Those passed unanimously. So then moving to uh, our second item, well, our first item of new business, uh, the IURA budget. And we have a resolution here. Nels, would you like to start us off with some, some, some sure. background? The, the, the deep background is we have an obligation to submit a draft budget to the authority's budget office by November 1. So this, that, that creates the timeline for us. We're preparing uh, the budget and some, and we also want a working coordination with the city's budget usually as well. So the, the hope is we can get a recommendation from the committee that bring it to the IRA, IRA next uh, later this week um, so that we can post on the website of the public authorities uh, state website. The uh, the budget as uh, as you may have seen in in the packet is is pretty simple this year in many respects because we have some extra resources, but as usual, uh, and with almost all government operations, the major draw for expenditures is staff. We have three and three, four, three and two thirds staff. The proposed budget proposes to maintain all the staff uh, and the budget re recommended is a 1% increase, a little bit less than 1% increase this year. And that's really driven largely by the the fact that uh, the health insurance premiums uh, this year are only at 1%, which is a great uh, benefit for this year's budget. We'll see what happens with next year's budget uh, on that because it's probably due to a lot of um, uh, personal decisions not to seek medical attention, medical attention during the pandemic um, in many respects, if you had a choice. Uh, the the staff uh, budget uh, salary increase is a little uncertain. We usually track with the um, city's administrative unit, which is the largest uh, labor nego negotiating unit in the city. Their contract expired, so we don't have that guidance. The only contract that's still current is the executives uh, group, which is kind of an odd, it includes like engineers and uh, kind of you know, technical professionals, I think is when I think about it. Uh, they're in the last year of their contract and they have a 1.75%. So I tracked with that because it's the best guidance we have. The city's budget uh, in, developed by the mayor does not include any increase for salaries, but they do have a reserve for addressing salaries when they go into negotiations. So that's the framework that I, I worked with. 
and then we have uh, legal and independent consulting services drives expenses as well. Uh, and in this case, uh, we expect we will be, we're hopeful and we expect to be able to close on the uh, tax credit project with INHS for uh, what they're calling Founders Way, which you might know better is the Immaculate Conception School Redevelopment Site. Um, so we're, we're setting aside some legal fees uh, in anticipation for that, those are reimbursed from INHS when we close. So uh, um, that, you know, we're keeping those expenses about level where they were last year, but um, we, we have been very parsimonious in expending our legal expenses this year. If you looked at the year to date expenditures were way below what we had budgeted for. And that's partially a, a result of Charles's very good contracts that he drafts that don't require a lot of legal attention. Um, and the fact that we've gotten just a little bit smarter about how to use legal services um, and use our templates more than, than having to ask legal review for every single document um, in great detail. Um, so now, that's the- Before you go, go to the revenues, can I ask a health insurance question? Yes. Not a specific one. You said the expense is likely to rise in 2022 and you're saying increased influence by reduced medical visits. I, you're not saying by by our specific reduced medical visits. You mean the overall pool, so there have been less yeah. expenses, the statewide yeah. pool of use. Yeah, we're in this Syracuse small small employer group uh, division, so it's it's really more central New York, but it is uh, small employers uh, in that group of fifty or fewer. Uh, employers. I mean, how many is how many in that group? I don't actually know the exact number. Um, I mean, I no, are we talking about 5,000, 50,000? I'm, I'm, I'm curious how many are in the group and what forces drive the rates? Because then we're looking, of course, long term, what's happening in New York State with health insurance and um, uh, Supreme Court actions and so on. So, uh, yeah, what's I could find out point? more about that. I know, I yeah, I know our small group area covers the larger ge um, metropolitan areas of Binghamton, Syracuse, and Ithaca. So, um, that's <clears throat> and Excellus Blue Cross is one of the few that will provide uh, insurance to not for profits, and I think even for for profits, they're uh, one of the two major players. When you go onto the state's website to see who provides. Uh, offers offers health insurance premiums and are licensed to do so in the area. So, um, but I can I can I get some input on that and what see what the size is because it would you know we if it's too small of a group any one claim can actually impact your well, your premium yeah. that year you know right um, what I'm why why I'm kind of suggesting that it's low this year and will probably go up is that the city's self insurance uh, premium is at five percent this year. Well, they're part of the consortium, but they're a smaller group. They're, you know, maybe 3,000 employees between everybody in that group or something like that, maybe. Uh, maybe not even that many, but they're at 5% this year, and that was a little bit lower than the prior year, but they're nowhere near 1%. Uh, so we just expect that there's going to be some, some pent up demand. What our long term vulnerabilities would be, and so on. So, okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So on the expense side, we're really talking about holding steady and the overall budget numbers uh, at about 389,000. On the revenue side, we're expecting to exceed that amount by about $40,000 uh, in revenues. And that's driven by three main things, our HUD grant awards, uh, of which for CDBG, 20% can be utilized for admin and planning. For the home program, it's 10%. Uh, some changes to our loan repayment schedules because of deferrals and uh, payoffs and uh, reimbursable expenses that have um, we can expect to continue uh, to pay for staff expenses like my staff time spent working on the Green Street Redevelopment Project. So generally speaking, the grant awards is a great boon for us this year in, a, in, an, in an ironic way. Uh, the pandemic has increased funding for CDBG and that increases admin funding available to us. We're essentially $760,000 between the two uh, CARES Act awards the, to the city of which the IRA administers those grants. Uh, so that's um, very helpful and uh, and also produces quite a bit of work for that 3.66 persons as well. So Charles and Anissa are very busy. 
Um, our repayment schedule is impacted by those deferrals that we've approved in the past and maybe some more coming in the future. We'll have to see where things go for organizations like the State Theater. They don't have a clear opening date yet. Uh, so that's a tough place to be when you have loan payments and you, you're not allowed to open up. Right. Uh, yeah, but the bigger issue that, that occurred there was the Cuga Green um, loan, which was a 6% interest loan. Uh, that was the loan for the Cuga Green apartments and the lofts at Six Mile Creek adjacent to the Cuga Garage. They paid that off, which was great because we got, you know, $760,000 or so uh, in the bank from that, but we lost an income stream that was 60000 per year strong, and we've re- kind of turn that around and relent much of those funds to INHS to acquire properties that they intend to put into a low-income housing tax credit project, those properties at 107, 109 South Titus Street, but they're only paying two and a half percent interest on that money. Uh, so we've lost you know $40,000 almost in terms of, of the loans repayment stream on that in that impacts us. Uh, and then finally, uh, we do expect the Green Street Garage project to continue on into the new year, but it'll reduce the amount. We've, the, you know, it's it's moving towards construction, and at, at some at some point, the lion's share of responsibilities get turned over to the city as an operator and a lessee. Um, but we don't expect to really close on that whole project until February, um, in terms of kind of completing all the agreements, uh, and that's if everything works out. So um, that's that will continue on and pro provide some additional income for us in the in the in the form of reimbursed uh, staff time. So all told, we think that with those grant awards, um, we're coming out positive on that. Uh, and it's quite strongly positive. Um, uh, our accountant thinks that even if we, you know, normally we would, our, our budget would be covered about 45% from the CDBG awards. This year, it'll be seven, uh, 2021, we expect 75%. Uh, and you, normally in this year in 2020, we'd have a small draw on our non-CDBG account uh, to cover that kind of gap between what our income generates and uh, between income and grants and what we need to cover for our expenses. We don't expect any draw on our, on our non-CDBG account this year due to the CDBG CV awards. So, uh, and we can carry much of those awards over into 2021, $120,000 worth of admin awards into 2021. So we're, it's a good little cushion that we can maintain a little reserve uh, for rainy days uh, in our non-CDBG account. And I did include at the back of the budget uh, our bank balance analysis, which looks at our cash in the bank and uh, where where we are at a couple of snapshots in time over the last three years, as well as uh, an on, on obligated balance uh, as of September. So the, the I guess the big issue here is that um, we don't. It's a very modest kind of hold hold steady kind of budget and on expenses, and it looks like we're going to increase our revenues and build up some additional assets, but. Not significantly, but still it's to the good. Can I answer any questions anybody has? Nels, what I'm hearing you say is that we've got a little buffer as mm -hmm. the uncertainty of our global existence continues. That's correct, yes. Yeah, okay, good. And, and Nels, um, and thanks to that CARES Act buffer and about, that's, that's really gonna help us out. And in the pipeline for 2022, 2023, are there rumblings of other projects that um, may be potential candidates for loans that will provide us with that kind of, um, you know, loan payment that we're, loan payment revenue that we're losing with the uh, payment on um, Cuga Green? Yeah, we're, we're, we're always looking for the next project and the next uh, program. I mean, we're applying for some grants and we'll talk about one of the grants later in the meeting, uh, yeah. uh, which also, can have administrative funding um, provided to the agency. Uh, we've talked about in the past, the urban renewal projects can yield um, revenue to the agency. Uh, the next project site that's that's picking up steam is the Inlet Island site. We've got right. um, a developer who's uh, the original developer, Steve Flash, who's coming back in November to the ED committee mm -hmm. to talk about his plans. And we have another party that has expressed interest in acquiring the parcels on Inlet Island that the agency controls. So that, that'd be one potential source. We're also working with John Guttridge in the urban core development on the Cherry Street Industrial Park land at the end of the site there. That's slowed down a little bit with COVID, but that's still in play for you know continuing investigation on 
uh, potential sale of that property for redevelopment. And uh, um, and then we're you know we do have more loan funds available this year because the agency uh, strengthened uh, recapitalized some of the ED loan funds. So we're looking for more loans. We just issued a loan or we just approved a loan for home cooking. The, the business on the commons that's going right. to merge yes. breathe with 15 steps. Uh, and so between that and Green Star, we've had a pretty robust uh, loan program in the last you know, year and a half. <clears throat> but, uh, and we have some additional resources to make additional loans. Uh, the, the question there is, are we gonna be making loans that are repayable or are we gonna be trying to provide viability for right. not-for-profits that are on, on the edge, I guess, and right. are not in a position to make repayable loans, at least not in the short term. We will cross that bridge. <laughs> um, so, oh. yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Kathy, please. I'm just, because morning's not my best time. If you <laughs> haven't had the income from all the COVID related things, what would the budget gap for next year be, basically? Not specifically, but in the ball, that's the number I need to keep in my mind. Yeah. Um, the gap would probably be about $25,000. Uh, because we're building up the 05 account uh, in the last couple of years. So when we draw from it, our, our goal has been to make sure we don't draw it. You know, we don't, uh, the balance doesn't reduce from year to year. We're trying to keep it at least level or increase. Um, so, but we did, yeah, we're probably in that category about 25,000 that we uh, would have to draw from that. It doesn't mean that we would necessarily, um, I'm not sure that that balance would go down. Uh, we still need to do some more analysis on that, but there definitely would be a draw on our 05 bank account, which is our non-CDBG fund, local resources. Uh, I'm concerned that the um, uh, that what we're looking for is, uh, well, so what are the developers bringing us so that we can have some component of it to fund the the uh, mandated act activities of uh, the Urban Renewal Agency. In other words, we're in the second position, waiting to see what the fates blow our way. And it then makes you or whoever's in your position, essentially a form of staff to those particular development interests, as opposed to us being in the driver's seat, having our own funding source, our own authority, where we can decide what the needs are of the community and act on act on those. Uh, it, I mean, an example is, for instance, that the um, um, we've done a lot of rental housing because we can't find the money for owner occupied, but there are the tax credit programs that exist for rental. But then that puts all sorts of attachments on it. So what I would like to be able to talk about when we get to this broader topic under strategic planning is how can we create um, a funding source and a funding stream that is our funding stream as opposed to us being downstream and hoping to pick up a little bit of the, the trickle by. So See where we head on the strategic planning, taking in any ideas that you've heard and, and so on. Okay. Great, and a good point. Um, so we'll get to that um, on the strategic planning. So we have a resolution for the adoption of the fiscal year 2021 IRA administrative budget. Um, unless there are any other questions, would anyone uh, move this? Thank you, David. Is there a second? Thank you, Kathy. Um, and we have the resolution. Any discussion? All those in favor? Yeah, Aye. You're Aye. moving the budget at this point? Moving the, bu the budget, exactly. Having gone through any of the specific individual lines, we're not going through the additional numbers. Unless um, the general overview. We got the general overview. We have the uh, specifics here. I asked if there was any further discussion. So if there is, and anyone would like to go, you you wanted to to go uh, through a line by line before. I wasn't looking for a line by line, and I'm always interested in what other people have picked up from 
looking at the line by lines to see that strikes sure. them as, as an issue that they have questions on. So I was uh, looking to see what there is. Well, we can, um, I think that. Just if nobody has any. Uh, yep, yeah, if, if there's. Specific observations, fine, but. Do you sir? Do you have Do you have any as well? Uh, and then we can we can confirm the vote later. Um, not really. Not not in detail. I guess I'm more concerned about the the broad line. Uh, you know, I always want to know what we're doing for our legal lines for cultivating backup legal services should some of these people choose no longer to be providers for us do we have other people that we are that we are trying out i mean i think the way we got to our third person is if i'm not mistaken that she had done some specific task work for us so i'm looking to see what we're getting in terms of any any specific tasks from either the legal, um, the um, profession, any of the professional consulting lines, um, you know, the, the, uh, as people are aging out, do we come up with needs that we go, oh, maybe we should have someone else take a look at this. So I didn't know if that had come up under the Economic Development Committee or anything else, if there's specific tasks. You've talked about these people being very involved in the upcoming you know, developments and then to be reimbursed. But in terms of specific urban renewal agency expertise, are there HUD topics that uh, we wish to develop greater depth with. So I don't know what Nels has to say on that. Yeah, well, well uh, Marriott's been our go-to for municipal IRA relationships because of her experience, both the city attorney and its agency uh, uh, attorney for many years. Uh, we're expecting her to be crafty. And a lot of the agreements related to the Green Street Garage uh, project as it relates to the IRA as a matter of uh, acquiring the property formally from the city and reselling it to the developer with a lot of contingencies on that sale. Uh, Sharon Slomowitz is our newest attorney. She's been reviewing legal agreements, primarily uh, funding agreements and done a very good job of that. So we're looking to grow her work a little bit more uh, and expand uh, her services. She's been very timely and she's um, a lower cost uh, legal expertise as well. Uh, and then Russ, Dick Rustwick has been our low-income housing tax credit expert after doing about four of those projects. And that is a specialized area that um, it takes a learning. If you've never done one, you, there's a learning curve on that. And so we're expecting to keep um, using, utilizing Dick, but thinking about whether we've actually asked INHS, um, are they satisfied with Dick Rustwick doing that work in terms of you know timeliness? It, it, there's a lot of time deadline issues related to that and a lot of documents to review and they have been satisfied with that. So uh, we were prepared to try to bring Sharon Slomowitz into that uh, genre, but right now uh, we're deferring to INHS's uh, request for who they'd like to work with because it is a, an ex they end up paying for the legal services basically, I guess is one way of thinking about it. Uh, so we're working on that. And then the, in terms of community development and economic development um, consulting services. Harry Sickerman has developed a transition program. He's taken on new staff and has a, Chuck Bell is his partner now who are working out of Western New York. So we have kind of, you know, Harry is uh, getting older in age near what he talks about retirement, but I don't think he knows what retirement means. So he continues to keep working as much as ever, uh, but he did create a program, you know, um, more resiliency for his organization and more depth. He has uh, attorneys on staff and he's then um, we're working with uh, his underwriter, um, Elizabeth Krauss, who's done a really good job underwriting loans. I think the ED committee has been very impressed by her work and her thoroughness on looking at loan applications. She was an M&T commercial lender for many years. Uh, so I think we're in 
in good stead continuing that work, although we will make decisions in January about independent contractors. This is a kind of a budget that sets aside funding for those categories, but does not necessarily uh, commit that funding to these individuals that we're currently working with. Well, I'm concerned, yes, uh, about the services Harry's group can, can provide. In the past, many years ago, we turned to Harry quite often to say, what else are people doing across the country? What other prog programs are there? As opposed to the um, ED loan review, very specific mm -hmm. task. And so there was a, a, a broad familiarity with exciting new programming going on. And I would like to keep an eye on whether, who will be providing that within Harry's group? Have we used them at all for uh, that type of background research? Hey, how is, how is anybody else accomplishing this particular problem? So I'd like to you know, know how Harry's group is going for broader co concept information for us. Um, and on Dick Ruswick, let's see, number one, did he do the um, NHS land trust? Mm. No, he was a board member of the uh, Finger Lakes Land Trust, but he, he didn't develop that land trust agreement, I don't think, no. Oh, who did? I'm not sure I know who it was. I mean, it wasn't, oh, I mean, I thought it started on it, and I was looking right now, the point of my question is so I was looking for, okay, who, again, this is programmatic development, who, who creates something. It took a very long time to get that, to have a land trust. NHS should have had a revenue recapture mechanism decades before. And we as the agency kept saying, so how are you gonna prevent windfall profit sale of these properties? How are you gonna get the money back? Oh, we're, we're working on it, we'll, we'll do it. When I left there in 83, it was, we should get this done. Well, there are a lot of things we should get done and they end up sitting for decades. So, okay, so to your knowledge, Dick Ruswick didn't provide the necessary expertise for pulling together that very specific program. My recollection is Elena Flash started on the work. Oh, yeah. Then there was a, an attorney up um, with uh, Sacconi's, uh, I can't remember what the name of the firm is up on South Hill. I can't remember where, um, our former assistant city attorney works now. Um, uh, and the name's escaping me, but then I think Carrie Pollock finished the work. <laughs> so I think it went through so like three attorneys. It local, local expertise. Yes, yeah, it was. Local. I mean, they were using the Vermont Land Trust model and talking with the consultants from um, NeighborWorks on it, I think, throughout that process as well. But New York state law is different from Vermont state law, and they had to make adjustments to that yeah. model. I'm trying to figure out where the expertise is that we can acquire to do any sort of exciting new programmatic funding mechanisms. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Good question. If, um, there are no other questions about particular line items in the budget, um, and which, you know, again, doesn't, this, those conversations aren't precluded from. Um, you know, in the future uh, as items in themselves um, in terms of planning. So we can always return to those, any others that we have any, you know, future thoughts about um, sustainability in the future about. So uh, we have the um, resolution to adopt the budget uh, was uh, moved and seconded. Um, we were mid vote. Before you vote on it, I yes. did want to say, I will be voting against it. I, it's, a, it's a good budget, it's reasonable, but it's um, a, a year by year approach. And I have real long-term concerns, concerns about our long-term sustainability. So in order to make the point that I think, I know we need to be looking at some additional <clears throat> funding mechanisms and creating and devising mm -hmm. our own in order to make that point i'm going to vote against it um and i'll leave it to you eric to convey to the agency why you had a split vote on this but it is a, a statement vote saying okay we can do this this year we can eke it out the next year but 10 years from now 
where will we be? And I think not where we want to be. So that's to explain my no vote. Okay. Noted. Thank you, Sue. And I can respect that. And hopefully the strategic planning process and as we go and look at our strategic plan and develop it further, um, can give us the kind of guidance you know, you're, you're looking for and that you find lacking right now. Um, so all those in favor of adopting this administrative budget? Aye. 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 Kathy, David, myself. All those against? Um, opposed. Sue. Um, and so the resolution passes uh, three to one. And I will convey that Sue to the uh, board. <clears throat> and we then move to the um, Anti-Displacement Learning Network, um, Team Ithaca's um, proposal. Um, and uh, there's a, a funding proposal that uh, it isn't before us. We may have a role, I guess, in the, in the future in Nelson. I'm, I suspect that's why it's here. Um, and so you're we will. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> we will yeah, move. No, we'll it, move to that. I was ex actually kind of very excited about the work they've been doing and, and our proposal to join the what I believe is a state-sponsored network. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, this is this is an enterprise um, uh, initiative where they receive funding from I think it was the bank settlement still from those from many years ago and uh, uh, made funding available to communities that. Um, wanted to work on anti-displacement initiatives. Right. Uh, the uh, Ithaca submitted, I think we talked about it with the agency that we were moving in that direction, certainly talked about with the mayor, there was a tight timeline for, for that initial um, indication of interest in the program. And, uh, and Ithaca is one of the communities selected to work with. And the, and the way this, this thing is framed is once you're in, uh, brought in to the enterprise network, the learning network, you receive technical assistance to develop a, a more concrete program, uh, which you then can apply for up to a million dollars from the enterprise fund to implement. Uh, so that's been the framework here. They had very, you know, very strict standards on how you create a, a group, a working group, and and the kind of focus of that group. And you can see in the materials that the local group is really led by two leaders who convened it. That was. Um, Lydia Barger from the Human Services Coalition and Anissa from the IRA. They brought in a city representative and the, you know, and the uh, city representatives and not-for-profit representatives from the community and wanted to have diversity in that. And they have been working for many months uh, with with shifting priorities from enterprise <laughs> and shifting issues related to uh, COVID and how to bring this together. But they have now submitted a proposal for anti-displacement uh, initiative here in the city of Ithaca, very much focused on reducing evictions. And, uh, and, and when there is an eviction, how do you provide stability for that, you know, for that household that is at risk of eviction uh, is really their focus with a recognition that the city of Ithaca, and this is a city of Ithaca focus. It doesn't right. try to provide much in the way of benefits for areas outside the city. It's really a city focus and a focus on providing assistance uh, to people who are facing affordability issues to the extent of being um, displaced from their housing. Uh, it notes that from our, <clears throat> our fair housing analysis that we know that uh, uh, persons of color who are, are increasingly uh, at lower percentages of neighborhoods that were historically um, more diverse, such as the South Side neighborhood, and the city at large is losing population of lower income people to the surrounding area. And we've seen a shift from south side to and from south of the creek to West Hill, where we have the largest affordable housing projects uh, for lower income persons. So those are kind of the, the facts. The, the question that's coming up is um, this, this uh, submission application has been submitted to Enterprise in a draft form. They will provide feedback back to the group. And then you kind of make your final application and enterprise will make their final decisions. Part of that effort is to figure out who at the local level would accept the grant, administer wow. the grant and implement the grant because it's That's using it. this wide variety of different resources and programs to, uh, to work at, at trying to address the, the issue. So why I'm bringing it here is because uh, the group has suggested that the um, 
Human Services Coalition and the IRA take a lead role on being grantee and administrator and, and organize this. We both, both of our organizations have deep experience in working with grants. Um, but they, you know, we, you know, we both, I mean, there are challenges to this because we're working with groups we haven't worked with before um, and, and on initiatives we haven't worked with before. And I wanted to, you know, get your feedback on what you think is a wise way to proceed going forward. The two major models that we discussed are basically, <coughs> excuse me, either the IRA is a grantee uh, and then works with, you know, sub grantees um, uh, to administer the program and report and monitor on it, or the Human Services Coalition takes the lead. And in either case, the other group would be a major sub grantee essentially, or maybe even a partner. Uh, we don't really think it's a, a wise approach to have a 50-50 kind of deal, I mean, because nobody's ultimately responsible then, but uh, but we're looking at what model works best. So if, if Charles, if you could continue to scroll down that screen to the, the graphic that has uh, the quick reference chart. Right here, you can, this is the reference chart that kind of summarizes the major activities they're proposing. And these may change based on feedback from enterprise, but you can see on the left kind of the different groups that are involved. Charles, can you just shrink that a little bit so we can get that bottom line in? The trade off between reading it and having it completely there, I guess. Um, you can see that there's requested project delivery funds of about 13%. So there's some administrative funding to support this, but it's probably an 18 month process. And the different players involved include, you know, Cornell's Law School and the Ithaca Tenants Union and Law New York, which provides legal services, uh, and 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 uh, staff at the Human Services Coalition, such as the two-on-one program, and essentially a, a, a navigator uh, to kind of coordinate things. Um, and the big funding piece of this program, although there's several large ones, the big one is the Housing Stability Support Program. And that's really to work with tenants who are facing eviction and provide them with some um, kind of strings-free funding for 18 months to right the ship, so to speak, and provide that stability without a lot of, um, a lot of conditions and requirements uh, other than working with, with with them with some case management, but by and large, it's a pretty uh, it's an exercise in exploring whether um, three hundred dollars a month, which is kind of the oftentimes the difference between affordability and not affordability in the city, uh, will it, was, would be successful, and to monitor whether that approach is is, um, is is a good model to follow to prevent displacement and provide long term stability in the city. So that's the $300,000 piece. The other ones are <clears throat> focused on prevention much more and legal services to provide tenants with uh, uh, kind of an equal footing to contest their evictions and to look at uh, and to educate them on tenants' rights and tenants' responsibilities as well as landlords' rights and responsibilities so they can be smart about their approach. Um, I know that... Kathy's been very involved in this from her side as well. So I'd like to give Kathy a chance mm -hmm. to touch base a little bit on the program. Um, yeah, I know uh, you pretty, you did a great job of explaining what it is. It's, it's basically, um, you know, the funding to help people stay in their homes, but the services that will either, you know, on the front end, keep people from facing eviction and then if in fact they um, are facing eviction services, they can help them um, as they move forward. So I think this is a group that they put together, you know, whenever you're talking about this kind of support services to people, you could include 20 agencies, you could, um, but I think where they, what we really have looked at and they've looked at is this particular displacement issue and where are the gaps, um, really the gaps around um, helping people stay in their, in their housing. And this is, I just blanked, is this all rental or? Yes, this is all rental. All and, uh, rental one time, right. At one time they had worked on an initiative yeah. on home ownership, but that got pulled out. Uh, right, that did get, yeah. That's gonna they be a did, separate they initiative. Yeah, I think that's going to be a separate initiative pursued with INHS directly. 
Right. They weren't, I, yeah, that's a whole long other story, but um, mm -hmm. right. So this piece is just about the rental. Um, you know, if your tenants union is a fairly, I believe, new or, uh, you know, recently activated organization, um, there's three years of Cornell Law School involvement. They're, they're committing to three years of this kind of course and, um, uh, you know, legal representation. Um, yeah, I don't know if people have questions and I don't have any idea. I mean, I should have some idea. I think there are only 10 organizations in, that were invited to apply and they have like $10 million to give out. Those odds are good as far as applying for grants go, but I have absolutely no idea what um, this organization you know, what their intent is for, you know, um, for um, distributing this money. I have some real concerns about this because it comes under the heading of anti-displacement. And I said, oh, goody, we've long talked about displacement as a problem. It was perceived as early as the late seventies as what's going to happen. Afi Bintaloid was one of the people talking about that. But as I look at this particular proposal, this isn't moving, this is only moving again to the tail end of the problem. This is anti-eviction. This is when you've gotten way down the line this, and, and um, are trying to keep people in their housing. And the problem is so much broader than that, which is how do, you pre how do you create a program that can be of assistance to people before they face eviction problems? How, what, do, what are the needs of renters to help them access either more affordable housing, which is just about impossible given the amount of, um, of tax increases that are hitting properties now for a landlord and a property owner to reduce to reduce rents, you just can't do it. So if you can't reduce the cost, then where do you help people to come up with funding? And it's certainly been my experience that um, tenants need a massive amount of handholding and assistance to direct themselves to funding sources, be it section eight, be it for instance, most recently the NHS administered uh, was a CARES Act money, which last I knew that had not been fully expended. Maybe they managed finally to get it fully expended. But the initial, the, the problem I would start much earlier than this, which is all bring in the lawyers and bring in the courts. And let's, um, as, as opposed to how much can you do beforehand? I mean, I've had a lot of experience with trying to hold people's hands and get them to the correct funding support services. And there's a massive difficulty on people's part, either in believing that they are eligible, that they deserve it. In some cases that I don't need public support. Well, actually, mm -hmm. yeah, you do. I don't see anything in here that does that. And I'm also very concerned because the, the earlier numbers seem to indicate that um, um, a racial ethnic disparity and um, what I'm concerned about is when they look at white tenant population, are you aggregating all the Cornell students into that, people who do have the resources? Because it's certainly been my experience dealing with um, working poor, which covers the full rainbow spectrum, that it is, very difficult for a huge percentage of, um, of white population also to afford the rent. So what you're getting here is something saying, um, if you're black or brown, you need this additional support. We're gonna be focusing it here in this direction. So that's one very small issue of where you're going and how you're allocating it. But most of all, 
this doesn't do anything to prevent the problem. And I cer and and so I would call it an anti eviction program. I certainly wouldn't call it anti displacement. Displacement is the eviction is the end result at the end of the line of displacement forces. And this isn't dealing with other displacement forces or assisting the people in greatest need. It's coming in at the end to fight it in the courts. So I certainly would have liked to have seen a program that involved serious upfront understanding of why people haven't been able to access available funds or you have to wait for available funds get in line now and let's let's do this let's help people to get the money that exists let's create the clearly documented need so that you can can uh, argue with the fed so that you can point you're overdrawing the budget we need more section eight here we need more of this so this is just this looks like an angry, let's get the evil landlord and prevent these folks from being evicted so they can stay there. I I'm all for keeping people in their housing, but there are many steps to be taken beforehand. So I, I don't know what, um, and Nels, what your familiarity is with this. Why is this only enforcement and anti-inviction enforcement and not the broader picture of displacement? Nels or Kathy, because Kathy had a big hand in this as well. Well, I know from talking with Anissa that um, they they struggled with the issues you you're talking about, Susan. That that you know the uh, catching somebody upstream before eviction, it's very hard to connect with them at that point. There's no mechanism really in place to catch people very easily on that. There's the informal agency coordination. Oh, and that one. Reach out to somebody. Well, that's part of what they're trying to do with the 211 and right. the hotline is to provide kind of a, a go-to place for landlord for tenants to connect with. Whether they you know choose to go there before they <laughs> you receive an eviction notice or something is up to them to some degree. And maybe we can educate people that you know reaching out early when you you know or to the landlord to reach out if they think that they want to provide support because uh, that can be a piece too. A part of the program was what. Uh, uh, originally uh, uh, under consideration is what Kathy was referring to in terms of the home ownership initiative, which as I understand is being developed separately uh, because uh, it, it, it re I guess it was thought is more appropriate as a separate one-off funding source. Yeah, and because fine. INH has a direct relationship with enterprise, they thought that there would be, a, I think it's, as I understand it, it's a home ownership in a South side neighborhood initiative to increase home ownership from lower and middle, middle income persons uh, particularly those who have a historical connection to the South Side neighborhood and South of the Creek. But when they looked at the funding stream and the amount of subsidy necessary, they were talking like eight houses. And so their concern was would, would eight would eight homeownerships, eight to 10 homeownerships really make a difference in this kind of a grant application. Um, so they, and, and they, and then it, I, as I understand it, South Side was, 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 critical in supporting that. And I think their choice was to move it out of this application and move it to a separate approach. I'm so not looking for home ownership promotion in this. Right. Well, that was, but that, that is, is a different, separate and expensive uh, responsibility and program. Yeah. And that's what but they I'm came looking to, for. To. How you finding a way to contact the people who are eligible for assistance. And that mm -hmm. probably means finding conscientious property owners, landlords, who want to be able to send their tenants to someone who will be the navigator, not the navigator of the court system, but the navigator of the funding assistance system. And that should, certainly should be something that NHS should have the in-house capacity to do. But it's, it's, you know, you run the home ownership programs, but the rental assistance. People want to be able to go to a friendly person who will talk to them and figure out how to make it work. Right, Charles, so, can you can you pull up that kind of visual with the with the arrows and the bubbles? <laughs> uh, yeah, um, that tried to show a little clearer what their goal was. Uh, can you keep going down, Charles? Down. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, that one. There we go. Yeah. So that's trying to yeah, visualize the program right. a little bit. Let me bit. follow that one. 
<laughs> well, but you see, what I want to point out it makes everything real clear. What I want to point out too is in the center, maybe it's not quite large enough, is the housing coordinator. So that's really the hotline, the, you know, the kind of the point of contact for the tenant. Uh, and then they can uh, refer them to a variety of locations. You know, if it's a legal issue, it goes one direction. Uh, if you see it, uh, going from a, a hotline coordinator uh, in the middle to the right-hand side, the housing coordinator, which is kind of, I don't know if that arrow is right exactly, but yeah. um, the idea here the arrow is that- isn't going to the housing coordinator. <laughs> it's going back there. I don't know. I'm not sure if I understand that exactly right, but maybe it's, <laughs> it, it, it works its way this down. this diagram, you know? Yeah. Um, visuals can be great. They can be confusing too. But uh, the the idea with the housing, the hotline coordinators, I understand it is to be that warm, you know, person with, with some good knowledge about programs in the community and connect them with those uh, in kind of like a warm referral to an agency where they, you know, they understand enough that this person should be eligible for that program or might very well be eligible for that program. Then the housing coordinator is playing more of that role. And you see below the housing coordinator, the enhanced 211 navigator. That's where we get into that housing stability support program where there's actually cash funding available to the tenant to maintain their their you know their rent in in the community. Um, you know, three hundred dollars a month for eighteen months can make a difference for a lot of people, which would be money paid to the landlord eventually to keep them in good stead. If there was a sense that that was going to be a workable model for re, for retaining them, so I think there is some resources there. I think they also were challenged by the fact that. Um, connecting people with pro programs that have waiting lists is not a very successful model. I mean, the Housing Choice Voucher program has a 75 person waiting list looking to find housing. So just referring them to Housing Choice Vouchers is not going to really solve a lot of people's needs uh, until they rise to the top of that list. And then it becomes a great program for them. Um, so it's, they were trying to create a little funding source as well, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, but they are very, you know, they're still very open to feedback from uh, enterprise and from the community. I mean, they're they're trying to struggle through and find out what's going to be successful. And I think they, you know, would be. I think they plan to reshape this based on feedback they receive. What amount of funding? What percent of programmatic of the of the grant or the funding goes to the housing stability support program? I think it's three hundred and twenty-five thousand yeah. dollars. Three twenty. Was on that previous chart, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, three twenty-five. And then the enhanced two one navigator at ninety seven thousand is also supporting that program. So you could, in some ways, say it's closer to four hundred thousand. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of where they're under this housing right. stability support program. Where's the breakdown on how the program works? How many people work in it, or it's what? Are, be, uh, it's a, it's intended. Is the is that's the pot of money, or is that a pot of money plus administrative staff? Mm. That's, that's just a, a pot of money. That's a pot of money, and the ninety-seven thousand is kind of the staff or the primary staff to support that to benefit fifty tenants. I don't know if they have. I mean, I think it's a soft facing eviction. I think it's housing instability could fit in that too. I know the group's been talking about working with local judges to find you know mediated responses um, before it gets to a true eviction <clears throat> or through the full eviction process. And yeah, there you know, seems to be some support for from local judges to say they don't want to be in the process of evicting people. They'd much rather send it to a mediation, some funding sources to resolve resolve it uh, amicably. So roughly 400, 420 of this goes to the funding renters uh, to to stay in place. And then another 40,000 to the Ithaca Tenants Union to, they're kind of the primary hotline source now is a, a for tenants as well. I think that's the goal for that program. That must be Carl Foyer's um, baby. Carl's yeah, he was on the team. Which parts of this? Uh, I'd like to know which parts Joanna Anderson is pushing, what parts, I'm sure that it's a group effort and they're all unanimous in what they put together. But I'm um, sometimes people have people have specific focuses, and they expect certain outcomes to come from pushing their vision. So um, that's simply why I asked Kathy. Have you been to any of the meetings of this group? I have not. No, okay, Libby, it's Libby. Libby who's on the group. Libby right? goes. Yeah, I think one of the things that we had <clears throat> have always recognized, 
you know, there's a couple of things that it always, one that Law New York was not allowed to get involved in a case until it was um, going into the courts. So we've always known what we really needed was some kind of eviction hotline where people could call up much earlier and get legal advice before it became a court case. And that's why we wanted the kind of hotline that, and we also know that not everybody goes to the same place. So if there's more one place that people can access this, that's a good thing. We know that, you know, it, Ithaca is Ithaca. People are going to rent apartments that they can't afford. And they just, you know, I mean, uh, we all live in little, you know, miracle thinking worlds where somehow something's going to happen and we're going to be able to afford it. And, um, you know, so there's, I think there are, you know, there probably isn't enough in here for education, you know, and landlords, they rent to people who they pretty much know are not going to be able to afford their apartments. Those the things, landlord has a pretty strong incentive to wanting the tenant to be able to afford it. Sure. Sure. I know, but the landlord also has a strong, you know, and I'm not saying that landlords are gonna, they're always really honest with each other, you know, about, I mean, that there's, I mean, Ithaca is what it is. If, you know, you can't be making minimum wage and rent an apartment in Ithaca and, you know, pay for it. So it's, I think there's a, a lot of work, you know, that I think is gonna be done by some of the, um, the navigators and the housing people really, we know one of the big issues is working with people to get them to understand what they can afford and what they can't afford. And, you know, this is a program built on the fact that we all know that we don't, we can't have the answer because the answer is we do not have enough housing. And yes. so you do, you know, you do what you can to get as many people to um, be able to get to a point where they can afford the housing that's uh, available. So, um, you know, I, I actually agree with you. In fact, when I think of displacement, I tend to think of, um, yeah, I shouldn't, you know, own property owners as opposed to, and I think of an eviction is more um, uh, rentals, but it's all displacement, mm -hmm. I guess. You know, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the average, that'd be, I, I don't know if anybody knows what the average length of time that people rent a specific place in Ithaca. Did that make sense? Well, I think it's very different in Ithaca because we're a very, we're a very mobile community, uh, right. which people are coming in and out and it's a very younger, younger population. So you're going to have a high percentage of people not ready to acquire. And of course, acquisition and of, of housing, people used to buy housing much younger. Um, they used to marry younger and settle younger. So, uh, you know, they're part of many different trends coming together here so that you don't have, so that you do have a huge number of renters. And I do want to know what that 27% of what population, 20% of what population of white renters, um, because uh, I, I really feel that there's a, a massive working population. If you if you've folded Cornell and I see into that, yeah, you're gonna get that figure. But that's not who actually, I think it's our business to be assisting. That's the universities and colleges business to be making things possible for their students. So um, I'm, I'm very concerned. I certainly understand poverty relationships, but poverty affects all populations in this community much more so than in other communities, I believe. So was this uh, just for like, for well, information or? Nels, you asked the question at the beginning in terms of um, how might this be housed within the IRA? Should we be the um, agency to sort of be the, the awardee or the grant awardee, or should it be Human Services Coalition? You were looking for some feedback from us on this, if, I'm, if I wasn't mistaken. Yeah, no, that's right. It's still an open question how, yeah. how it would, if awarded, how it would be, um, who would the grantee be and how, how right. it would be monitored and administered. 
uh, my argument, <laughs> you know, my personal preference is yes. that the agency play a large role in the program, uh, particularly take the lead on the um, uh, stability support program with the yep. kind, of, kind of monthly rent payments. But because we're not familiar with some of the other players as much as Human Services Coalition is, such as Law New York and working with Cornell. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Ithaca Tenants Union is not a group we've worked with in the past. Uh, so I think th those are all areas that um, Human Services Coalition has greater familiarity with. And then because the Enhanced 2-1 Navigator is playing a large role, that will probably be a Human Services Coalition employee or a contractor uh, that I guess see that as more cohesive if uh, the Human Services Coalition has the lead but the IRA would, would play the would be the major um, responsibility for administering the the, the uh, payment program, the housing stability support program payments over 18 months, and then taking a you know a partnership role with reporting annual reporting and monitoring. Um, that's my preference, but uh, I. Kathy may have the same preference on the opposite side. So we'll have, no, we'll have no, to do we absolutely, <laughs> we, we've talked. The housing stability support program, you guys are set up to do that. Um, you have those kind of relationships. I I mean, I, I'm like you, I have not worked with the tenants, so the advocacy, or what is their name? The tenants yeah. union, if the tenants yeah. union, I have not worked with them, nor do I frankly know much about them. Um, but, <clears throat> And it is not clear to me yet, and I don't know if it's clear to anybody, how, um, what kind of reporting is required? What kind of, is it a voucher program? Is it, do you get the money up front? I don't actually, and maybe I should, have, I should, but I don't know the answer to some, do you? No, no. I think we've asked actually Enterprise for more information on those yeah. issues. Um, yeah, and this is just a draft, so they're not in the, I don't know when the final is due, frankly. This is such a complex topic with so many interwoven factors. One of the uh, players that's not on the, uh, the bubble chart here uh, actually is City of Ithaca Common Council in terms of how do you affect, how can you control displacement? What actions are before the council which have an effect on the housing availability, the housing supply. I just happen to be thinking one of the, you know, Kathy was talking about displacement. Gee, I used to think of it in terms of homeowners, people with greater, bigger, bigger wallets moving in and being able to buy and displace homeownership, which certainly was the traditional original vision, but it now you're also dealing with displacing um, uh, renters. One of the bit, one of the factors that's um, creating displacement is again is Airbnbs. And you look at any house yes. that's going on the market, and you try to figure out: Can we please guarantee in some way that this buyer is not going to Airbnb this? And so I don't know what the, has the city actually moved anything. We've ta they've talked about it a lot. They were going to study it. And there is nothing in place to prevent. I'm looking at the house around the corner from me. It's a bungalow. It's going to go on the market. And I know that people will look at it for Airbnb. Oh, what a nice neighborhood. Yeah, I'd like to um, spend a weekend here. I get people spending a weekend uh, next to a um, in a house that I used to own on, on Pleasant mm. Street because the person posed as, as a, a homeowner, never lived in it. It's Airbnb. Oh, it's such a nice place. Is this going to be a quiet neighborhood for me to sleep in this weekend? This weekend. I want somebody who's going to sleep in the neighborhood for the next 10 years, whether they own it or rent it. So Airbnb, all of the um, housing and planning actions before council affect and should fit in somewhere on a, dis a view of displacement, a broader, a, even a broader overview chart that shows the effect yes. that it has. And I, of course, I know Eric is pretty familiar with um, mm -hmm. Airbnb and um, it's a different type of neighborhood instability, yes. but it's sad. And it's, right. it's affluence driving out 
people of less affluence. Yes, absolutely. Nels. Uh, just on that point, Susan, so you're aware that the Housing and Neighborhood and, uh, Investment Committee is looking at that issue. They invited Tom Knipe to their last meeting to talk about Airbnb and short-term rentals. Uh, and uh, Tom has good expertise in that because he tracked it as his role in tourism at the county because uh, Airbnb was making a payment uh, like a hotel tax payment uh, in lieu of that payment. And so he's done a lot of research on it and there are um, technology solutions for tracking it now where you can, you can basically essentially um, use the web to find out where those places are sure. and, and yeah, you can use that for enforcement techniques Good. on it. But the city has not established any framework for it. Um, you're correct. There is no framework for it. Uh, although there are some proposals uh, led by Tom actually about approaches which would uh, discourage um, single family homes from being used for Airbnb. I mean, strongly discourage. It, <laughs> yeah, happens, so. it happens at at point of sale through the realtors and the homeowner who wants the most money for right. selling their house is I would bet that if you can't track that as easily through the, the, the web, but that's where you lose the house for the long-term stability market. And right. But if the city passes, passes, mm -hmm. Yeah, but if the city passes oh, an ordinance, it can control whether it allows short-term rentals or not for exactly. Houses. And there are models like that in, a, I mean, New York City has a pretty strong model. Um, if you, you know, you can only uh, Airbnb a certain percentage of time out of a year. I, I forget what it is. Maybe it's eight weeks or six weeks. Um, whatever the point is, the point is that that that's a concept you can you can you can bake into an ordinance. So Eric, Eric you know, can I ask you a question on yes, this. Go I mean, ahead. Uh, sure, no, we have an IRA meeting on Thursday. Would, would I, I, yes, I'm going to ask you for action, but do you think it's appropriate to share the same material with the full agency and bring up the issues that have been raised? Absolutely, I think so. Yes, I'll include that in the agenda. Yeah. Then I don't. And it'd be great to get Tracy's every, input. No, I won't solve every problem today, but <laughs> no. So um, I think are you are you now taking away what you were hoping for at least some guidance in terms of. Uh, Grant awardee. I mean, we will, we will not be the grant awardee for all of this, given, nor will there be a split. But it sounds well, like it, Kathy, did you want to say somebody something? may need to be the lead agency? Yeah, right. That's usually how grants. I mean, maybe they won't, but I'm guessing. Yeah, I think that is what you're asking. Whether you contract, subcontract out some of the stuff, but. Yeah, I think we need we need feedback from enterprise first, and then we need to have, sit down between the Human Services Coalition and the IRA staff and come up with what we think <laughs> is the best model, and bring it forward to both, you know, and see where we go. But we have time on that. It just want to get a lead sense, uh, and you know my preference now. <laughs> so yes, I'd rather not be the lead because of the multiple players, and and because several of them are probably within the Human Services Coalition. Uh, organization in terms of the 211 pro, two program and the coordinator. I don't want to know. manage, I don't want to manage Kathy. <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> there's, a of, there's a lot of pieces to this grant. That was one of my concerns is when you have that many players, getting the reporting in can be a nightmare. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So not a particular nightmare I'm looking to take on, but <laughs> we, we can certainly have that conversation. And I don't know what other committee members think, but I, I also share Nels your your preference as well. Um, so good luck to both of you figuring that out. <laughs> no, <we'll see. laughs> I this always, is when I wish I think we had gone to some meetings. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Sue, for bringing up the point about you know the greater point about what displacement means, and uh, we'll discuss at the agency the Airbnb issue see where we are with that and um, um, try to get at this further upstream than what this is proposing to do. Um, so then, unless there are any other comments or questions, let's move then to uh, CDBG CV3 funding award. There's right, a report. The, the, it's kind of out of order, but, but you have the HUD letter in your packet making yeah. the third award. So the CARES Act had a $5 billion award for the CDBG program over three different 
tranches of that. The first tranche was funding we received already, which we've earmarked for a variety of programs in childcare and, and eviction, uh, you know, uh, supports or not eviction, um, rental assistance, emergency rental assistance, et cetera. Uh, the second tranche was assigned only to states, so we didn't receive any funding in that second uh, round of funding from HUD out of the $5 billion. Just as a relationship, an annual uh, funding budget for the federal government has about $3 billion for the CDBG program, so five was more than we would see in one year. And then this, this letter is the third tranche of funding and final CARES Act funding of the CDBG program. So it'll bring our total to about $760,000 of CDBG CV funding, which can only be used for COVID response issues. So it's not generally available for everything else we do. It's gotta really be tied to uh, impacts of COVID, which are broad and numerous. So it's not really that much of a challenge, but, uh, and the one group we're seeing that is real, I mean, we, we're, we're of course, very concerned about how the rental housing market's going to play out, especially with no new stimulus. But the other group that really doesn't have any support system um, available to it yet is the not-for-profit community, especially those that rely, you know, have earned income and rely on social proximity, like the State Theater and Sinopolis and Kitchen Theater. Those are all organizations that took years of support and resources to the community to build up, and they're all very tenuous grounds right now going forward. So we'll, we'll have to keep a track on that. So any questions, comments? Nels, I'm just curious sort of, I know this is hard to quantify, but do you have a sense mm -hmm. of what that need is? Like state theater, nonprofits? I mean, I know we're midway, I mean, we might not even be midway through the, the pandemic. And so I know it's hard to quantify, but you know, how much does this address it? How much is it just a stopgap? A lot of that depends on whether there's more stimulus, but because um, yeah. most of them have gone for PPPs and now have burned through the PPP funding. Realistically, if you you know if I were to model it, I would say say it's a it's a model of viability. You know, how, what are your fixed costs going forward? You're probably going to have to lay off staff, almost everybody. And what does it take to keep it? You can re-establish it after when you can have the public come again. Now, is that nine months of rent and mortgage assistance? With a with an you know half an executive director or something, uh, you know that's the kind of way I'm thinking about it for organizations that have no revenue opportunities. Some of them are very creative and are finding some of those, but there's such a modest amount compared to where they were. Um, you know, I talked with the state theater, and they say they expect to be the very last ones to be allowed to open up. <clears throat> you know, for for large groups of events, and that's that's their business. So they don't even have a target opening date. <laughs> you know, they, they they don't have anything to work with there. But we are working with them and have actually asked them to give us some input on what is, you know, what does it take to sustain them so they are able to come back from the ashes, so to speak, um, when when they can open. Are they able to open as a, as a movie theater? Well, movie so theaters movie are theaters closed are, too, are closed as well though. Well, movie theaters are open now. Uh, and, no, I, no, I don't think so, are they? Not in New York State. Not in New York State. Yeah. Um, I don't Just, think so. Yeah, but he said when they, when they can open, and it's pretty soon. Okay. Yes, oh. yes, they're going to open. It was like a very, it was oh. maybe as little as twenty five percent capacity. I don't think it was fifty percent. Oh no, it was an absolute number on people present. Hmm. I think and hmm. Eagle Cinemas, which is what we have here on the big in the mall is not a part of the group that's planning on opening. So did Kit, right. did um, uh, State lay off all their staff? How did they do it? And in Kitchen, basically they all retired, right? Well, there's some of both of those, I think. Um, the State has, was meeting with their board, I think last night, or maybe, maybe it was on Monday night uh, to discuss their future. Uh, I don't know, call it a resiliency plan. I don't know. I mean, they're, they have been able to keep their essential staff, not the ones who are involved with putting on productions, but they, you know, the executive director and finance person have uh, on, but I think it's it's near the end of that uh, that funding stream they had available for that. And so they really have to make some hard decisions going forward if there's not more stimulus they can access. And does Kitchen have anyone on? I don't know enough about Kitchen to give you any I mean, good information. I mean, they hired there. a new person to replace Bevan O'Gara. Yeah. And that person was going to come in, but I haven't, 
Well, I haven't gone to the website, but there haven't been any communications. And then all the old line staff, Stephen Lumley and so on, all retired. That's so what I understand. Retirement, yeah. I suppose, is one way of keeping your organization afloat. But I mean, you know, it, this is, um, thank you, Nels, for thinking about the nonprofit community and in particular, the um, live venue and entertainment communities, which are devastated. Yes, Keep so up. it is Friday. Friday movie theaters can open, but oh, it okay. Some it like there are a lot of counties where they can't, including Broome, Schuyler, Cortland, um, and they can only open at 20, 25 percent or a max of fifty people right. per screen. I wonder if um, Schubert Foundation is coming up with any interesting funding sources for the theater venues. <laughs> I mean, they're a major theater funder, so. I'd I mean, say well, thing, we might find some interesting partners to deal with if you actually have funding money that can be dispersed to provide a lifeline for for not for profits. Um, and it, since we did get into doing theaters, it does take us into a totally different venue than what's traditionally the human services right. coalitions and uh, collaborative. Right. I've been meeting, the funders were meeting, well, they're meeting once a week now, they were meeting twice a week for March, all the funders, and they were looking at, you know, nonprofits, including all the theaters, and theaters, theaters are in trouble. Um, and, you know, it's, it's hard to, hard to know if any of these places are going to be able to come back. Yeah. Daycare centers, you know, theaters, if, if you lose... It was Sudale Hall was saying 44% of daycare centers are not opening. That's a lot of childcare slots to lose. And, you know, those daycare, they move on. They're not, you know, they're not just sitting there waiting for this to be over. So, and I don't know what we're going to do with all the regals. Regal yeah. just shut down. It all yeah. just shut down. So more yeah. empty space. Yeah. Housing at the mall, that is what the malls are going to, right? <laughs> Senior housing <clears throat> in the malls. Sounds delightful. Mall out in town. <laughs> My dream to retire <laughs> to a mall. I will have that opportunity. <laughs> well, great. Any other thoughts or comments on this? Then Let's move on to the IRA financials. Did you want to do ribs now or do you want to? Uh, right, we did add that as the first item in the other business. Thank you, Nels, for reminding me of that. Yeah, let's let's do that. Um, uh, just for the um, for those of you who may not know, and maybe Kathy, David, I, I know Sue's well aware of this issue. Um, Southside Community Center had um, closed down its programming, um, furloughed staff, that included RIBS, um, which is a program of the South Side as currently configured. Um, and this is also a time when bicycle use, right, is up and really actually critical um, in our community. And so um, the team at RIBS, which had been laid off, I don't know if it, if it was a furloughed or laid off, that that point was lost on me. I, I'm not. It's not clear to me. Um, I think they were laid off. They were laid off. Um, we're upset at being laid off, and also at not being able to address a need that's really urgent right now and timely. Um, you know, couldn't there be another way uh, of dealing with this and and meeting that community need um, and feeling um, that you know this was this was a surprise um, and that maybe they'd be better off becoming independent again. So RIBS used to be its own entity um, and would it make sense for them uh, to be able to make decisions about their own fate um, themselves. And, um, and so where we last left this at the agency where we got a report on this was that the um, the staff at RIBS were going to be meeting with the Southside Community Board um, 
and seeing what they could work out. Uh, so this was about three or four weeks ago. Now, if I'm not mistaken, there, there, there was a meeting planned between the board and the RIBS team. Um, and and, and the hope was that there would be something that, you know, some kind of agreement that they could, they could come to. Um, otherwise, Ribs, Ribs was coming to the agency to say, you know, um, you know, could you, could you, could you, could you help us? Um, and um, there is a lease um, and involved, but that lease is pretty tight. There really isn't anything that we could do. Um, uh, nor do we want to get, I think, involved at that level. Um, so now I probably didn't do such a great job of summing that all up, but um, I think I covered the main points. And uh, so there, this may be coming before the agency if a resolution wasn't forged out of that meeting between the board and RIPS uh, team and the RIPS team. Right. Has any, <clears throat> now have you had any more contact with the um, RIPS guys lawyer? We know that they were partnering they were going yeah. for their own 501c3. They were being taken under the umbrella of a Cornell entity whose name neither you or I could could recollect. The organization, maybe, maybe Kathy knows it, that's um, uh, yeah. CTA. an incubator for not for CTA. What? The Center for Center Transformative, for Transformative Action. Action. Yeah. Yes. And so has, ha, how are they proceeding on that? Um, action with Cornell with their 501c3 and then the other problem was a building uh, yeah could they get back into that building which has much to do with Southside Center and then the uh, bigger promise is there another building facil or facility out there somewhere to accommodate a growing bicycle program which we should have in this community that that addresses a whole range of, of, mm -hmm. of bicycle needs, issues, and, and services. So, Nels, any contact with their lawyer? Well, I did have... Um, Justin something? J, J, Justin Woods, something like that. Yeah. Um, I did have some brief contact with them following up on our, uh, after the IRA meeting, indicating uh, basically we left it in his court to update us on any initiatives. Um, so you haven't they heard had, from him. And I have not heard back from them on that, uh, indicating that um, they were going to pursue trying to find a uh, amicable uh, solution working with Southside. Uh, uh, since then, I know that uh, the issue is likely, to, uh, the general issue of Southside uh, Community Center programming is likely to be discussed in the city budget because the city does provide funding for Southside programming, about $58,000 a year. And the mayor's budget increases that by about 30,000 in his proposed budget. Yeah. Um, it does not, in, there's no specific language in the budget currently of, about how that money is allocated and I, the mayor's um, statement didn't reference ribs particularly because I think that's still an issue in progress. Uh, I don't have, I mean, I didn't know we were going <laughs> have the agenda item, so I didn't do any research or, or reach out to anybody to find, get an update on that well, or where things stand and whether there was any positive relationship, you know, coming out of that meeting with Southside or not, I, I actually wonder. don't Obviously, know. you've just been sitting around twiddling your thumbs, oh, and doing a budget <laughs> <laughs> and everything else. Now, yeah, I, um, I yeah, I, I uh, who else should be, con could be contacting Southside? I mean, we really should know, should find out um, what happened. Just left the last agency meeting, it's a, a month ago, you sent them away to say, go meet. And we don't have a report back for Eric to pass on to um, the committee. What was the outcome of that meeting? And yeah. I am independently of that, what is the entity doing if they want to do standalone? So, because I, there is a role in some way for agency participation. We put them into that building we, mm -hmm. we gave them that derelict city building, told them to go fix it up. As you know, I'm not fond of that. But anyhow, um, yeah. could we please find out, even if they're not getting back to us, we can then 
find out what they're doing and then go, oh, well, they actually nothing has happened in the interim, then fine. We don't have to think about it at, for a while. I think I'd like were... to see it mo become something accessible for the full community. We're not asking my opinion here, but I, there was one question. I There was some question about whether there was some indication that RIBS had its own bank account. Um, that money was set aside for that. And oh yeah, it does have its own bank account, right? With with supposedly forty two thousand or something in it. Right. So who owns those funds? I think is a question. If you're oh yeah, no, I don't think uh, there's any. I don't think there's any question who owns those funds. Those are South Side community right. uh, resources um, because there is no Ribs legal organization right. currently. Right. It's a program of yeah. South Side. So those are. So sad yeah. resources. So I'm sure that was the question that came up at the board meeting. I would also, if anybody has any, please encourage them not to become their own 501c3. <laughs> that it just, it's such a burden. People think, oh, that's a solution for everything. If that okay. does not work out at Southside, which I'm not saying I think it should or shouldn't, mm -hmm. there are other organizations that they could become part of that mm. would not require them to have their own board and bylaws and committees and spending right. all their time doing administrative work. Right. I mean, Finger Lakes Reuse, uh, there are other. Hmm. That's interesting. That's, that's my, that's, I always give this speech. I always try to talk to people out of becoming 501c3s, but people just love to do that. They just think that's great. So. Sorry, I have um, a 10 o'clock meeting I have to yeah. jump off for, but it was good to see you all. Good to see you, David. You're doing well. Thanks, David. Take care. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> that's my spiel around there that, yeah, and it's much that's easier it. to become one than it is to dissolve one. So, that's right. Well, <laughs> yeah. What? What? Uh, my plan, based on this conversation, is to reach out to both the rib side and the south side community side and find out from them if there's any update they want to provide the IRA, and just you know we'll get an update from them from each of those perspectives uh, or ask for one, and then we'll have a little more information to, to start with because I really don't. I think that's a good starting point to find out it's kind of a polarized situation if you haven't noticed <laughs> between uh, yes. you know the landlord and you know, or, or the program you know the um, former employees and board. So let's let's get a little input from I asked for an input from each of them and see yeah. do we have. <clears throat> Nels, thank you. I know I just uh, put that on the agenda, so I appreciate that. And uh, we will be discussing it at the agency meeting as a, because we'll want to know that follow up anyway. Um, from the previous meeting where we left it at, at with that cliffhanger. So let's see. I hope I hope there's something amicable that um, Ribs feels is fair and will work for them. If not, um, you know, I you know I I personally am not sure. Uh, well, we'll let let's see where they are. Um, so then let's move to then to the uh, financials and we'll start off with the grant summary. Right. This is a good, boring grant summary because yeah. we don't have anybody who's on the <laughs> languishing list of not we implementing like the programs. Yeah. Uh, the 2018 program is uh, really the, the earliest year that has some money still outstanding, but those are all uh, programs that have completed or we've taken back the funds that, that are remaining. And those are monies that are earmarked for the next uh, COVID response issue. When you see the 2018 funding totaling 38,000, that's available for reprogramming that we've talked about with the agency. Yeah. So, so basically we're in, you know, and, and the home activities are likewise all moving towards completion. The reason why they're not down to zero is HUD requires periodic disbursements. So for a program like 402 South Cayuga, if we spend it all out early, they would be telling us we're not in compliance because because we didn't have a disbursement once every three months or something. So we spread it out, and that's about that project is getting close to being ready to sell those townhouses on, on 402 South Cuba. They had a long COVID um, interruption in the construction process on that project. Otherwise, I think every everybody else is moving forward. We're going to encourage um, <clears throat> the hospitality employment program to submit some billing. They they usually submit. Charles, are you trying to speak? They just did. They they just, okay, yeah, uh, we were because they hadn't drawn any of their funding from the 2019 year at over 100,000. So um, they they uh, we get a better sense on where their spend down is because the city pays for their funds up front and we reimburse the city. So they're a little 
slow to ask for funding um, disbursements from the agency sometimes. Otherwise, everything is, is in good order on the grants. Uh, loans are current with the exception of the Finger Lakes Massage Hoop that we're gonna discuss with the ED right. committee uh, next month and figure out where we're gonna go with that one. And the lease payments, although you see a couple of red uh, late payments, everybody is current currently as we speak. Now, what about a place to stay? A place to stay. Uh, is that the one at zero? Which one are you looking at? They also just submitted three vouchers. Oh, okay. They were, there you go. were very late in doing so, but they gave them to us. Okay. Thank you, Charles. Thanks, Charles. Good to know. Thank you, Charles. Great. Well, it looks. Yeah. Looks very good. Boring. Yep. <laughs> Boring is good here. Um, so then let's move on to the Green Street Garage Redevelopment and Urban Renewal Project. <clears throat> Just a quick update, update. on that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the, the, the overview is that both parts of the project are proceeding. They've um, so on the center and west section, that's the mixed use building with yeah. housing, affordable housing above a conference center. The middle section is a rebuilt parking garage with four additional decks. And the eastern section next to the Merritt Hotel is a separate developer. Uh, looking to rebuild the parking decks, the two existing parking decks, and add uh, 10 stories of market rate housing above that area. Uh, both those projects have gone through uh, site plan review processes and have been successful getting area variances. So a lot of the really thorny issues of getting through the entitlement process are behind them for the most part. They, they both have an completed their environmental seeker review, and that's, that's really good. And for the Vicino project, which is the, the Western two thirds, they have reached a settlement agreement with the adjacent property owner, Harold's Holdings, which had filed an Article 78 petition, which had the potential to uh, greatly delay the process at a minimum. And in that settlement agreement, they agreed to provide more physical separation between their housing tower and the Harold Square Tower. They'll now provide 45 to 60 feet of physical separation distance between those two housing towers. <clears throat> However, that means that they will have to reduce the number of affordable housing units in the project. So it was originally slated for 217 housing units, all affordable. That now is now gonna be reduced to 181 affordable housing units. Otherwise, the original program stays pretty much intact with a conference center and about 350 parking spaces in the center section and another 120 on the east section. Uh, and they're both moving towards uh, end of year kind of uh, agreements, we will be bringing a disposition and development agreement uh, to the Common Council for each of those once they are, in, are ready to um, move forward on those items. And that would be the final approval of at the city level uh, to move towards a commitment to sell property and uh, with a lot of conditions that they redevelop the property as they have represented, they would redevelop the properties. So probably, you know, if everything goes right, a closing in February, February, March time period. That's a lot of what ifs. Did you mention um, that part of that, the uh, agreement between Harold's and uh, the Vecino group involved uh, Harold granting, or David Lubin, <laughs> I guess, granting um, her, the uh, developers of Harold's um, some ownership of the land currently owned by Chainworks um, on South Hill for Vecino to develop affordable housing on. Um, I forget what percentage of the land. Um, and I forget what that equals financially. So while we're not going to, we're going to lose some affordable housing here, there should be some more developed within the city, but on the site of the former Emerson Power Transmission Plant? Right, my understanding is <clears throat> it's an option agreement to um, acquire property at the site that could support up to 100 units of affordable housing on the Chainworks site. Um, they don't, um, the Chainworks group doesn't technically own the property yet. Um, so it's a contingent option agreement because oh. it's still owned by Emerson until the cleanup right. is completed. But, um, but that, yes, it did structure an agreement in that regard and so, they, you know, there would be a 36 unit reduction in this project, but there might be as much as a hundred additional units at the Emerson site okay. in the future. 
It's really good point. Um, great. Thanks for that update. So um, if, if there aren't any other further uh, comments regarding that, uh, then let's move to strategic planning. So this is the issue that Susan wanted to make sure yeah. we touch base on. And we started the discussion, I mean, through the budget process a little bit of talking about what are some initiatives, but uh, really our, our bread and butter has been, yeah. you know, urban renewal projects, especially those where the agency owns the land. The Green Street Garage is a different model where the city owns the land and we become kind of the agent of the city. But for Inlet Island, we own the property and that gives us the potential to be able to sell the property with you know, seller financing uh, or other things that to both get a project that we support, but also a stream of income that might be able to support IRA operations. So that's been one area that we can focus on uh, that as well at the end of Cherry Street are, is a, in a similar situation. Uh, so those are, those are, you know, kind of within our control kind of projects, then there of course are things we can try to seek out additional funding for. Um, we, you know, the anti-displacement grant generates administrative funding. It doesn't go on for a long period of time necessarily. Uh, we just re were successful getting um, an EPA Brownfields cleanup assessment grant, which also has some administrative funding available to it. So there's, you know, again, filling in gaps here and here, maybe it's the mortar between the bricks. <laughs> what we need is more bricks. Uh, not just uh, piecemeal kind of funding year to year. Yeah. I agree with Susan on that, that if we can identify that kind of long-term stream of income, that's really the gold standard that we want to be able to find. It's not that easy to find those <laughs> projects, um, but we keep looking for what we can, you know, where it makes sense to direct our resources to research and find. Um, so open to ideas on what you would like to pursue, but the, you know, the state funding, which has been pretty strong in a lot of ways with restore grants and other things, which don't necessarily yield a lot of admin to us. As a matter of fact, they don't yield any admin money sure. for us, that, but they do benefit the community at large with like the, um, you know, uh, the Press Bay Alley and, and those kind of projects. But, uh, but the state funding uh, focus is, is very constrained going forward right now. As a matter of fact, the low-income housing tax credit program, which is, you know, usually a pretty rich resource for funding local program, you know, not just local, but statewide, usually funds 30 to 40 projects on an annual basis. They're looking at that number being closer to 20 this year. Uh, so there's really not, you know, we're hearing from all sources that they're, um, the state funding is not going to be as robust as it has been. As a matter of fact, they didn't run a uh, unified funding program this year at the state level at all. Uh, they just skipped it. <clears throat> so you can't really count on state funding in the short term. Uh, and that's very, very understandable given mm -hmm. the pandemic and the, and the lack of a stimulus uh, you know, program that assists states and cities. Uh, so we'll have to look at other resources. And right now, the best source, I think our urban, you know, development is still relatively strong in the city. People are looking to a time period when the COVID won't interrupt our lives as much as it is now. And we're still seeing robust development pressure in the city. And if we can somehow translate that, that would be wonderful. Um, the IDA recently took a step to capitalize affordable housing by requiring every project coming to the IDA for incentives to provide that includes how that include rental housing to uh, set aside 20% for affordable housing or make a contribution in lieu of that uh, development and that money would go to the community housing development fund uh, which funds affordable housing projects throughout the county so that's you know it's an interesting model if we can, I don't know if we can find a way to have funding flow to the IRA hmm. somehow it would be ideal but um, hmm. I haven't quite figured out that piece uh, the IDA continues to focus on uh, local labor utilization in projects. It's really not our, our area. So that might be the next initiative they look at in terms of uh, requirements. So, so again, you know, we're looking in the short term on urban renewal projects as a source of that, um, but we're still looking for that long term income stream to provide stability. Uh, the last four years have not been particularly um, strong in terms of CDBG and home funding. And uh, you know the present has zeroed out those programs the last three years in a row completely. And they've been reinstated by Senate and Congress. Uh, if there is a change at the top, we would expect that there would be a little more 
support for those programs that would at least keep up with CPI, if not more. Um, and those might be other resources, but that's not within our control really to, to manage that. So I think again, looking at uh, utilizing loans that are, re, you know, making loans that are repayable is, is one mm -hmm. is another uh, angle, you know, to look at where we're doing good for the community and providing some income back to the agency to support the initiatives we do. Um, but I'm open for other ideas to explore. Nels, could you tell us a little bit about the idea you mentioned to me that um, Teresa Deshir Halpert uh, was talking about the, um, what was it called? A, a, a community investment opportunity through lending institutions uh, uh, tied to affordable housing with a uh, higher yield for depositors than they could normally get. Yeah, Ter Teresa was looking at a, a model to expand affordable housing where um, it basically to look to, to a lot of individual donations as a substitute for bank financing where those, do not donations, I shouldn't say, that's not what it, her model was, was investments where people would be agreed to accept a lower return on their on their investment in, you know, recognizing the community benefit of that investment. So, you know, a two per two and a half percent return on your investment rather than a bank loan at six, you know, five and a half or six percent, which would decrease the cost to a developer trying to provide affordable housing for the bank portion. They'll still probably need other funding sources, but it could be a way that the community could reinvest in itself. Um, not that different from the way Rose Tree, <laughs> um, you know, approached, um, you know, buying important properties that needed rehab and renting those out and trying to break even or make a small, you know, similar to a, a CD kind of return and trying to look one for deep investors for whether there's people with deep pockets or the other model is to look at a lot of people and combine them together, you know, add, add $5,000 from a hundred people can create a pretty strong pool of resources that then not for profits can take advantage of to reduce the cost or maybe speculatively acquire property that they think should be developed. Now that was, um, I think the thinking that Teresa was, was looking down that road, kind of a crowdsource model yeah. for funding in, in many respects. And that's, you know, it can be surprising how much money you can raise in crowdsourcing. It also can be surprising how much work it is to raise that money too. But, uh, but it, you know, in some cases it can be really popular. And um, if you have the right, you know, support network for it, uh, efforts, it can be pretty uh, transformative in some cases. Um, so that was one model she was looking at. Was, was she talking about then these funds raised or deposited are held by whom are these is this a program that runs through a bank in the, pa in the past uh, afcu has agreed to take deposits and direct those funds as a way that the contributors or the investors decide if they agree in principle how to use the money they act as a facilitator for that it's almost like a directed <laughs> I mean, they would make loans. You know, if, you, if, if somebody put a half million dollars on account with the FCU and said, make loans for affordable housing at 1% interest, they would they would pursue that uh, in and, the past. So something like that, I, I think, is where she was coming from. But it doesn't have to be a bank that's no. holding this money. So the Urban Renewal Agency could do that. You could be a bank. Well, there are it's some there, there are there are some important concerns to understand when you start talking about an investment versus a contribution. So we'd have to be very clear about that because there are regulations protecting unsophisticated investors from losing their money. That's <laughs> what it boils down to. But so this would provide for the depositor, investor, not contributor, whatever, but the depositor, an alternative to the practically non-existent um, CD. Right, which, you're right, which is so low right now. So it takes it up and that's an incentive. And um, I mean, to me that the, it would seem that if it, if it can be monitored without major effort, we certainly are in the business of, of doing loans, of making that discernment, the judgment, the discrimination about who's, we're talking about handling New York State's money and, and sending it out to investors. But 
couldn't we be the entity that handles a fund? It's, it's, and I don't know what you call that, the steward of this fund um, and what regs control that, um, how secure is it, can it be made for the investors and so on. Um, uh, yeah, I, I shy away from talking too much about it because I don't know very much about the investment rules, but I know that they exist out there. Um, so I think I need to get some more research. Harry might be a good resource to, uh, Harry Zuckerman mm -hmm. might be a good resource to explore some of these ideas with. Oh, um, that's a good idea. Um, but I, 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 th I think the way AFCU treats it is they say, this is not an investment. This is a deposit, a directed deposit. I think they have a phrase for it like that, where, where it, can re it can repay money and repay loan funds. But if the loan goes bad, AFCU doesn't make it make a make, make that investor whole. It's they're implementing a framework for uh, the funds put on deposit with them. And they're, you know, if it matches up with their mission, which I think most everything we do would probably yeah. match up with their mission. Um, that's their framework of how they make it work. They basically say, you take, you put the money on account and you tell us how you want it for the framework for using it. And we'll administer it under the, under that framework. Um, it's, I mean, you talked about amazing how much money you could raise if people were putting in 5,000. I'm thinking in this community, we have people who are looking for alternative, um, al alternative, not invest, alternative deposit options that pay them a better interest than has currently been available, available for a long time. And so if people are putting in, you know, if you've got people who are putting in 100,000 and so on, you, you're mm -hmm. going to be getting a substantial hunk of money. Could, could you ask Harry um, if he has some familiarity with this or um, a place to refer us or any of us? I mean, I'd love to read more about this and find out um, how it, if it could work for mm -hmm. us, uh, for Ithaca by us. Ithaca, Ithacans, depositors, and the Urban Renewal Agency, and loans then for to development for affordable housing. Right. Okay, I can do that. I'm not sure it's going to solve our our kind of budget issue yeah. <laughs> because it well, seem... the, I mean, yes, the well, the whole comp that may solve a pool of it may bring in a pool of money to do the work to do the product, but it. To what extent can, can it have administrative yeah. money? To what extent is could it be a plus for the a agency for an authority, um, as opposed to a, a burden? Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I don't. I'm not looking for the agency to take on burdens. The question is who normally would hold something like this? Who needs to? Who wants to? Does a bank? want to have a bunch more assets to show to their credit so they'd be happy to do it does you know so just if harry's got any information or a place to um direct us to to take a look at i'd be mm -hmm. happy to look at this okay sounds good okay we'll do but i would agree with your assessment else too that yeah this wouldn't necessarily solve the kind of revenue we need it's exciting. It's an interesting idea. Um, I'm just off the top of my head. It seemed like AFC would be better equipped than us to administer that kind of thing. But um, and it seems like you know. I just want to say that it's with some meetings, um, it's hard to mix up brainstorming items with other more operational items, you know, in any one session. And I think it may make sense. I'd, I'd like to propose that, you know, the kind of brainstorming we need to, to get at um, this need for revenue in a more, and, and to be more proactive as opposed to reactive as Sue was pointing out earlier in the meeting. I'd like to just have a meeting devoted to that kind of session as opposed to a meeting that's mixed in with so many other things that by now I'm kind of tapped out, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's really hard for me to, to give this my all. Um, and it deserves that. And I wonder if it makes sense for us to maybe have a, a standalone meeting about strategic planning. 
Yeah. Um, I and, and do that. Yeah. Our, right. our, yeah. our January or February meeting is really about independent contractors to the degree that doesn't take a full meeting. It, it you know, it oftentimes is a pretty quick action. We could devote some time on that agenda um, you know, for, for an issue like this. You could even have a special meeting if you need it, because this is, I mean, I've got to go in about five minutes. I have some thoughts and questions, but I don't really have time to get into them. So, I mean, strategic planning is a very long, complicated process. So, Yeah, I agree, Kathy. If you want to get into it, I mean, how, how we set that up and how we get to those issues is, um, you know. You can do a three-hour retreat on that alone. Yeah, uh, you can yeah. set it up. So, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, too bad you used to be able to entice people to that sort of planning session with the concept of food, drink, yes, yeah. Yeah. reality. No. You know, nice setting. <laughs> send yeah. hair yeah. baskets to everybody's home to get us to sit down yeah. for three hours. Right, right. Well, maybe we'll have to do something like that. Um, but yeah, and I'd really like to have David involved in that too, um, in that conversation. And it may be, it may be also worth inviting other committee members from other committees. Yeah. Um, yeah. For you know, just just to have as you know, rich and um, a conversation as possible with all those other perspectives. There's so someone from ED and someone from neighborhoods. You know, um, in that conversation. I don't know what you think about that, Nels, joining oh. us at the governance committee, just to, you know, um, so maybe we can, you and I can talk, Nels, about how we might approach that and sure. and then propose something to this committee and then we can take it from there. Okay. Yeah. You know, one of the things yeah. I was thinking about when you were talking about is, as long as I've been on this committee, I'm not actually sure that I know what your, like, you know, letter of incorporation, what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. And it was like, huh, that's a good question. I should have asked that a long time ago to, you know, cause that really structures about how you would think about this. If you're only allowed to do certain things, then, yeah. then that would make me think about it differently. So that's a piece of information I've got to get before I have this conversation. Right. Yeah. We have explicit powers under, okay. under okay. our, you know, enabling legislation <clears throat> and we have in the abl make sure that we stick to those <laughs> enumerated uh, powers uh so yeah that's a good point well it's all in the interpretation also it is know? it is <laughs> well, it can be our own it's supreme part. <laughs> right but yeah okay oh, eric you're, oh, you're, eric, muted. you're muted so we'll, we'll come back to this nels you and i will talk okay we'll structure this so that and we'll in, be in more informed about what we can or can't do that would as an agency. Help. We'll review, review that as well. Maybe we send that out in writing um, ahead of time. Yeah. Now, is that, how long is the document, the, the enabling legislation? It's about two pages long. Yeah. I can send it out to you. It's about two pages long. I can send it out oh. after this meeting. Oh, yeah. Why don't right. you send that sure. out to us and let us take a take a look at it and see what we think that language says. <laughs> How are okay. Kathy, you can ask Ray what he thinks that language yeah. says. Let <laughs> us do spaghetti dinners on Friday night or doesn't it? <laughs> well, let me come to that. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> um, so, Nels, any, uh, you, I know, I know Kathy's got to uh, jump soon. Any pertinent IURA and Common Council actions of interest that um, you want to highlight? No, it's all budget at the city level yeah. right now. So they're just focusing on the budget and that's going to be the focus for the next four to six weeks. Yeah. And um, staff report. I did wish to want to update you on the um, Community Housing Development Fund met yesterday and made decisions oh. on recommended funding for this 2020 round of awards. They had more demand than they've had ever hmm. uh, in the rounds, which is a good sign that there's more and more people seeking funding. Um, so to summarize, they uh, renewed the uh, 
Well, I guess should start by saying the projects that are submitted for low income housing tax credits in the summer round from the city are the Carpenter Park project um, across from Oldies and the, let's see, and uh, Immaculate Conception, which is known as Founders Way, the, renter, the rental project. Uh, for, the, for the next round, which is in December, uh, INHS proposes to submit the uh, Tr Trumansburg project in the community. I think those are the only ones that we know of that are 9% tax credit projects floating around. Like I said, though, the state has much reduced resources, so very unlikely that all three of them right. will get funded. Um, we might be lucky to get one. Um, could be. So with that framework, um, we have other projects coming forward and the projects that were uh, selected for support by the Program Oversight Committee, which made up of the city, Cornell, and uh, the county, uh, were the uh, rebuilding of the Northside IHA housing project, um, which would, uh, they proposed to demolish all the project sites and rebuild them and add 12 additional units. So it'd be a total of 82 units in that project all of uh, with a much greater accessibility than they have now. The units really are not ADA accessible at all currently. Uh, the other projects that they supported were, um, were uh, the founders, INHS's uh, for sale scattered site housing project. That's eight units. Um, that's four of them on Founders Way site, uh, two, a duplex on South Plain Street and a duplex in Freeville. That was fully supported at the full request. Um, they've also supported Second Wind Dryden House project in this village of Dryden um, mm. to, um, <laughs> Kathy is looking at this saying, it didn't score very well in the, <laughs> the community. Um, they, were, they, they found that Second Wind is a can-do organization, and even though they didn't identify all their funding sources, they have found a way to get the resources in the past, and they thought they would provide a funding commitment of 120,000 to build four units um, at the Dryden, I don't know, the former, a burned out site in, in downtown Dryden. Uh, they've also supported Vism's State Street project at 510 West State Street. That's a low -in, that's Todd Fox's proposal that fronts on both West State Street, uh, Corn Street and Seneca Street. Uh, three different properties combined together to create a 64 unit project, which would be 100% affordable. Uh, and that was supported with at, at, at not a reduced funding, $100,000 for that project. Uh, the final that, two that project is um, going to be defined to retain the corner building? It doesn't own the corner building. So yeah, that would, that, it doesn't own, the, they don't own a corner, the corner building. Oh, they don't own the corner building? No, it's got a, uh, a, a storefront on West State Street. Then they have a, the property comes out to Corn Street on the side and then also to Seneca Street, but they don't own either any of the corners. So it's, so it's the Mimi's, but not the Mama Goose. No, no this, this is not I the Mama Goose that property. Too, oh, no, no. No, property. no, I'm on the wrong block. You're, no, on, you're, the on, wrong the block. you're on the wrong portion of the block. You have to go west. It's it's by Gimme Coffee. It's by Gimme Coffee. Oh, it's a little health Ithaca health store. Yeah, on it's the five, next block. Five five ten West yeah. State is the address okay. they use. So look that one up. Uh, that <laughs> needs to that that never went through the site plan approval process. That started the process and they 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 took a pause. So that's going to be coming back to the planning board at some point. Uh, the final two are smaller ones outside the city. Uh, White Hawk is a uh, uh, intentional Perfect. community and Danby, uh, they sought um, $210,000 to build affordable for sale homes. The group thought they would fund one project, one unit, and see if they could deliver on one. And if they're successful in that, maybe they would look at more. Uh, Habitat for Humanity is working with that group. And so I think this one might've been targeted for the Habitat for Humanity unit uh, because they have a track record of accomplishment, whereas Whitehawk has had some delays in their projects. Uh, and then the final project that they supported was Jamila Walida Simon's project in Groton to build a, a duplex adjacent to her home uh, on a separate lot to rent to Housing Choice Voucher uh, residents at two three bedroom units. Uh, at, that's $60,000 total for that. So those were the projects that they selected for funding. They, they found a way to fund all the projects at, at some or 
a, a partial funding. And they really liked the idea that there were some small scale projects as well as larger scale projects and there's geographic diversity, but plenty of units in the city here because IHA and uh, Visum's project are the two largest, you know, adding up to about 150 units and those are both in the city, as well as INHS's um, six of their for sale units are proposed to the city. INHS, I take it back, INHS did not get fully funded. They asked for 320,000, they were awarded 300,000. Hmm. So they may, um, it's very hard to put together a budget for for sale affordable housing because there really aren't any deep subsidy programs available right. for that. So that will, they may have to cut back one unit or downsize a unit or something we'll see but <clears throat> overall it was a very everybody felt very good about the program and uh, they'll see how many of these can move towards construction uh, we fully expect that some of the money that's been earmarked for tax credit projects will come back to the pool because uh, the competition is just too tight for tax credit projects and they won't all get funded so that was the I want to just give you a quick summary on that Kathy serves on the forget what they call it, the the review committee uh, that makes a recommendation to the decision-making group. <laughs> That's why I'm like, <laughs> that thought. yeah, this is the biggest, I think, pot we've had in ages. Yeah. People asking for funding. And I like well, the fact that yeah. there, there was a variety. It wasn't all, in the beginning, it's like all oh, INHS. And mm -hmm. so there's, you know, and, and this reflects the funding. So, and so a total of seven hundred eighty thousand dollars was a, was allocated out, plus renewal of of uh, three hundred thousand for the Treeberg project that was rolled over from the prior year. Um, that reflects the fact that the city's up their contribution to two thousand two hundred thousand dollars per year. The county has upgraded up upgraded their contribution to two hundred thousand, mm -hmm. and Cornell has increased theirs to three hundred thousand. So, there's on an annual basis going forward. If everything holds, that'd be seven hundred thousand dollars per year for affordable housing initiatives. So I, I'm going to have to take off. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, all that's right. It. Thank you, Kathy. See ya. That's all I had. Bye. Great. Well, we've got our next meeting uh, set for January twenty first, twenty twenty one. Right. And uh, I think that's it. I think uh, we can now adjourn. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, okay. guys. I guess we lost our quorum anyway, didn't we? <laughs> we did lose our quorum, yes. <laughs> okay, so Eric, look forward to a IRA meeting packet coming out later today, which yeah. will have a lot of familiar items on it because <laughs> the other committees didn't meet this month. Okay. So, <laughs> so, yeah, then, there. Uh, we have a meeting Thursday morning. Okay, thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Great. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, Charles. Thank you.